tonight on Inside Story. Happy birthday! He went out to celebrate his 17th birthday. Please, please! But he never came home. We started to cry. Murdered by his mate, whose uncle... He said, I'm a malat, you know what we do. Whose hero... He wanted to be just like him. ...was serial killer Ivan Malat. Murder just like him. For the first time, the key witness tells all. I knew I was a panic, he would have killed me. Then, the baby-faced killers... <laughs> ...who made their own real-life horror movie. She's gonna be alone in a dark house. They knew what they were doing. Two shocking, senseless crimes. They've not only destroyed us, they've destroyed their own families. They murdered their friends in cold blood. She was a beautiful person inside now. And filmed it. We're gonna be just like Scream. No reason. A beautiful grandson. No remorse. Gloating about the murder. They were simply born bad. I'm Leila McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. It's an age-old argument, probably as old as crime itself. Can a child be born bad? Is the evil, the bloodlust, there from the very start? Well, sometimes it certainly looks that way. In both cases tonight, Tom Steinfurt found the teenage killers knew exactly what they were doing. It was deliberate and premeditated. A thrill kill. They were on a mission. They, they wanted to kill someone. A callous murder carried out by two teenagers. I f***ing believe you. The executioner, oh. a young man who wanted the world to know who he was. Matthew Malat, the nephew of serial killer Ivan Malat. Matthew, you're going to be charged with the murder of David Do you understand that? Yeah. I just think he just wanted to big note himself like and be like Ivan and start that evil chain again. Malat's accomplice, Cohen Klein, not only stood by and watched this terrible crime, he filmed it. Who owns that mobile phone? Me. Matt told me that he just didn't like David for a while. And he just wanted to do it. Their victim, a young man who thought he was just celebrating his birthday with friends, 17-year-old David Octoloni. Within four hours of singing happy birthday, he was gone. This is where David Octoloni died so terribly, Belanglo State Forest. It's a foreboding place, but also a location with a chilling significance for David's killer, Matthew Malat. It was here that his infamous uncle, Ivan Malat, slaughtered seven backpackers. And as we'll see tonight, Matthew Malat was obsessed with the deranged serial killer. He wanted to be just like him to murder just like him. He said, I'm a malat, you know what we do. It says it all, doesn't it? Tonight, the tragic story of David Octoloni, who was lured to his death. The leader, the follower, and the witness, all caught on a mobile phone. Back down where you were! Lane, you just A world away, another cold-blooded murder. Killers also two teens. The crime just as brutal, just as brazen, and all vividly recorded on home video. I'm sorry, Cassie's family. She had number one. We have to confirm. She's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> two 16-year-olds who thought they were making a real-life version of this slasher movie scream. He's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. So we're gonna fucking kill her and her friends. We're gonna go down in history. We're gonna be just like Scream, except real life terms. As you'll see later, the videotape would be their undoing. Convicted for first degree murder on their own evidence, never to be released after filming the shocking murder of classmate Cassie Stoddart. Hi. So good night and I love you. And I said, good night, I love you. I'll call you in the morning. That was the last time I talked to her. But first, Bargo 2010. Local boy David Octoloni has been axed to death at the notorious Belanglo State Forest. 
a chilling story soon emerges, linking the crime to Australia's most reviled mass murderer, Ivan Milat. We've got a call. There's been a, a person killed in Blangelo State Forest and they think that a person by the name of Milat is responsible. It was you know, one of those times where you sort of check yourself and think that you've been G'd up, but it, it wasn't, wasn't the case. Meanwhile, the township is in mourning for the boy who was murdered on the same day he was born. He was a beautiful child. He was never any trouble and it was very rare that I had to discipline him. He was very clingy towards David and I. It was like we were just like his security blanket. David was raised by his nan and pop, Sandra and David Octoloni. It was an idyllic childhood. Davey would have been helping me feed the chooks, you know. Yeah, collecting the eggs and you we get, miss all those days, yeah, certainly do. You get those flashbacks. He used to get out with his grandfather and his grandfather would have him on the horse or out with the chickens or riding a bike. I was welding something together, I'd show him and give him a, a play with it so that later on in life he might, that might help him choose his path. David was a shy kid who drew homemade cards on Mother's Day. Well, he was only eight years old and he even went out in my garden and he pinched some of my flowers and he put them, wrapped them up, gave me the card and he said, Happy Nana's Day. And I'll treasure that for the rest of my life. As he grew up, David became more outgoing and grew into a popular teenager. Sometimes I'd have eight here and I'd be feeding them, always on lunchtime. They were all good, good kids, you know. So he was well known by all the kids and well liked. And then when he got to his teenage years, he, like we all do, want to spread our wings a little bit and want to hold him back. But we used to remind him, say, look, choose your friends. Matthew Malat was one of those friends. When he was a little boy, he used to come here and he'd play with David. Matthew was a, a sort of a loner kid. Growing up in Bargo, Matthew Malat actually went by his stepfather's surname, Muleman. But from a very young age, he had a growing fixation with his uncle, the serial killer, Ivan Malat. And then at age 14, he changed his name and officially became a Malat. But it wasn't just in name, he was also on the same evil path to infamy. Matthew Malat left school, left Bargo, fathered a baby and found some work in Newcastle. But before long, the aimless 17-year-old was back in town, ready to wreak havoc, ready to bring even greater shame to the Malat name. And he goes, you know who I am? I said, I'm sorry, but I don't. He said, you know who I am? And I looked at him and I said, oh, you're Matthew Muleman. And he goes, I am not Muleman, oh, my name is Malat. And I go, since when? And then he started to laugh and he had a really evil laugh. And I just said to David, there's something wrong with that kid. How about you, you know, distance yourself away from him? Why do you think he changed his surname to Malat? Because I think he wanted to emulate his great uncle and I think he wanted to be bigger and better. He, he had a mission. Still to come on Inside Story, the torment. David starts screaming, crying, telling him to stop. The last terrifying moments of young David's life. November 2010, David Octoloni turned 17. You. But what should have been a happy occasion was overshadowed by a disturbing conversation he'd had with his grandmother just that afternoon. He said, Nan, someone's going to go and kill me. And I said, who? And I said, I said, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, do you honestly think someone would kill you here in Bargo? I said, do you think about, would they go to jail for you? And he goes, no, you're right, Nan, you're right. And he was happy, you know, because we all say things in haste, but we don't do it. And did he give you an indication of who that was at the time? No, no, he would not, he would not tell me. But David's fears were well founded. This would be the last photo ever taken of him. 
While David was celebrating his birthday here at his grandparents' place, Matthew Malat was plotting a terrible crime. He wanted to kill someone, and that someone was David Octoloni. To do that, Matthew Malat chose a double-edged axe. Now ready for the kill, he arranged to meet David in town. Getting a lot of phone calls. Oh, he said, it's Matthew. He wants me to come over. We're going to go and have a party, a few beers for me birthday. So David headed into town to celebrate with his mates. And I said, now have a good birthday. And I said, you promise you'll ring me? He goes, yeah. And he said, OK, Nan, I'll see you. And he smiled, and that was it. But little did I know, well, that was waiting for him. David caught up with his mates here on the main drag of Bargo, where they'd normally hang out, have a few drinks and smoke some pot. But on this particular night, Matthew Malat had other plans. He suggested that they go down to Belanglo State Forest, the infamous place where his uncle, the serial killer Ivan Malat, murdered and buried his victims. In the car were Matthew Malat, his accomplice Cohen Klein, David and Chase Day. Chase Day knew nothing of the murderous plan. He later told police he just thought they were going out to party. David, he got a bit fishy about it and it seemed legit that they were, that we were just going there to have a good time and nothing was going to happen. Matt was calm, didn't seem angry or anything. Are we going to Blango? Yeah. I, I asked him why Blango at Forest and he's like, oh, it's his birthday, let's go and celebrate. And I was like, all right, well, what do we really, really need to go out there for? And he's like, oh, I just want to check out these plaques at this park that where I dumped all the bodies. And I was like, all right. And that was it. Just after 9pm, the four boys arrived here at Belanglo State Forest. Matthew Malat and Colin Klein went to the boot of the car and then asked David to join them. Their adrenaline was racing. Matt and Colin were talking at the back and I was sitting where I was sitting. And then I got out, just had a stretch, and then Octa walked around the back and I, I seen Matt with an axe and I said, what are you doing this for? And he can't, like, David started screaming, or crying, telling Matt to stop, because Matt hit him. Matt, you're fucking dead. Why would I do it? And then I go to Matt, I'm like, what, what are you doing? And he's like, you just get in the fucking car and just stay out of it. And I did, and I went and sat in the middle, and then Colin sat with me, and I was keeping my head down. I was listening to Octo just running around, just screaming, just telling Matt to stop. Back at the back, please, 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 please. And Matt said, come here. They took him down to about here. And he said, lay down. Please. Get on the ground. Please. Lay over there. And Matt was like, Octo was like, don't do this, man. Like, crying, saying he was sorry. Please. Over there. Please. You're going to stop fucking talking shit? I'm not bullshit. Right now, I don't f***ing believe you. For 15 minutes, David was tormented and tortured. And then, the final fatal blow. An axe to the head. And that was it. That's all I heard. And I just said, oh, end of what? Oh, oh, I just went silent. Minutes later, his body was dragged into the forest and covered with branches. At Nan and Pop Octoloni's, Sandra never received David's promised phone call. Nine o'clock came and he didn't ring me, and I thought, well, OK, he's 17, back off. And he never fronted that night, but we weren't concerned. We just accepted that, you know. The only people who did know his whereabouts were heading back to Bargo. At the wheel, Matthew Malat was on a high. 
Uh, if Mac was saying, oh yeah, that was such an adrenaline rush, that was all I heard him say. And then Mass, like, uh, Colin was like, I, I told you that you were going to go down the same path as your uncle, and that was it. Well, Ivan took out all those backpackers, and I think he just wanted to go that bit further. Coming up... Who owns that mobile phone? The mobile phone. You're under arrest. The fatal recording that finally caught Matthew Miller. You're under arrest? Yes. Matthew Malad had murdered his mate David Octoloni in the same killing fields. His uncle Ivan Malad had tortured and killed seven backpackers. History was repeating itself. The next morning, Matthew Malat knew he had to cover up his crime. So he came down here and bundled his bloodied clothes and the axe into a bag and tossed them into the watering hole. He thought he'd got away with murder. I've just about to pick up the phone and I've got a knock at the door and I was the police. He said, just please go and get your husband and that's when he said David had been murdered. Nothing came out. Stunned in the silence, you know. Didn't even burst into tears. I just, I didn't believe it. Overcome by grief, 18-year-old Chase Day had come into the local police station to make a statement. Now it's been explained to you that you're under arrest for your uh, involvement in the murder of David Octoloni, do you understand that? Yes. Day told detectives that fearing for his own life, he'd helped Matthew Malat move David's body. I knew if I, I, I was really about ready to freak out. I was ready to panic so hard. I knew if I panicked, he would have killed me. I offered him help to make it look like I wasn't going to do anything at all. He, he told me that he thought that if he made any attempt to intervene, that he would be killed. And I, I, I knew there was a knife in the front seat. I, I, I felt like running up there and just stabbing Matt in the leg. And right, so he didn't kill off Dave. But I was, I, I couldn't, I had nothing going, go, I had nothing going through my head at all. I couldn't think straight. While Chase Day was initially charged with being an accessory after the fact, that charge was later dropped when police accepted he'd not only been an unwitting witness to this terrible crime, he'd even tried to stop it. But for now, he was in custody along with Matthew Malat. I entered your bedroom and I said that you're under arrest? Yes. Yeah. Malat's well, accomplice, Cohen Klein, was also arrested. You're under arrest? 36 hours before, David had been celebrating his birthday with his grandparents. Now, he was lying in a morgue. We had to go down and recognise the body. Just the look on his face and his eyes were, you know, you could just tell the face of fear. And I started to cry. Both my son and I, we started to cry. But as David's family grieved, 17-year-old Matthew Malat showed no emotion. He was less than forthcoming with police. His grandfather, William Malat, the brother of Ivan, gave him support during the interview. Do you agree that I just, I asked you, uh, where were the clothes were that you were wearing on Saturday night? There's no news of that, Matt. OK. Well, what I'm, I'm trying to do here is just to, to corroborate what happened earlier this morning and the questions that I had asked him this morning. Yeah. Uh, is it the case that you're not going to answer those questions about what happened? Yes. Now, what I would like to do, uh, Matthew, is interview you about the murder of David Octolani. Do you understand that? Yes. Now, I want to ask you some questions about that. Are you prepared to answer those questions? No. Matthew Malat was charged with David Octoloni's murder. He refused to answer any more questions throughout the entire investigation, but detectives already had enough evidence to prove his guilt. The shoes he wore that night had David's blood on them. Malat's murder weapon, the double-edged axe, was found in the waterhole where Malat had dumped it after a bushwalker discovered David's wallet nearby. 
But it was the mobile phone seized at Cohen Klein's house that proved the most significant and the most alarming of all the evidence. Who owns that mobile phone? Me. Is that the only mobile phone you have? Yeah. It was this admission that would later seal Klein's fate. I was going to come into the police station this morning, but he got, me, got to me before I could get up and come to use. At the police station, Klein claimed he was just an innocent bystander. Had you spoken to Matt about harming David in any way? No, I, could, I couldn't do that, especially to a mate. But police knew that was a blatant lie. When you were down in the Blanco State Forest, did you have your mobile phone with you? Yeah, I was just sitting in the car. Mm -hmm. And did you use your mobile phone at all while you were there that night? So did you, did you attempt at any time to contact emergency services or anything? No. Cohen Klein never thought of using his mobile phone to call police because he was busy using it to do something else. He was filming the murder. Every single moment of David's last 15 minutes of hell was recorded. When the, the technical police were able to recover that file, we were able to hear the, the offence in all of its horrific detail. That included conversations between the Klein and Malat just prior to Octoloni being hit with the axe. You have to be ready if he gets away. Yeah, that's right. And it was abundantly clear from those conversations that Klein had knowledge of the offence prior to it occurring. Can you feel the adrenaline? Yeah. Just do it. He was there to help Malat become the legend or the notorious figure that Malat w w wanted to become. This was a thrill kill. <laughs> I believe Malat chose someone to kill, and it was David. The two teens, Cohen Klein and Matthew Malat, were now facing murder charges. Matthew, you're going to be charged with the murder of David off the lady. Do you understand that? Yes. Confronted with the damning evidence of the mobile phone, both Cohen Klein and Matthew Malat pleaded guilty to the murder of David Octoloni. But before the judge handed down the sentences, Malat passed her a note saying he was sorry. I have known and been friends with David and his family for years and don't know what caused this and pray that this is a bad dream and I will wake up. Sincerely, Matthew S. Malat. It was a terrible lie, because while in custody, he'd also been penning a series of poems gloating about the murder. Hear the crunch of leaves and feet. Feel your heart skip a beat. Are you gonna get away? No hope, kid. This is your day. I'd like to jam every bit of paper down his throat and hope you choked on it, but how could you? Not even hardened killers gloat about things like that. The judge wasn't impressed either. But unlike his uncle Ivan, Matthew Malat will be released. Malat received a minimum sentence of 30 years in jail. On appeal, Cohen Klein was given a minimum sentence of 20 years. I honestly think Malat should have got life and I think Klein should have got life. I just think I hope they rot in hell. Because they've not only destroyed us, they've destroyed their own families as well. You know. All I know is that karma takes over. I'll never forgive them. I'll never forget. And I just hope that someone else balances the books. You know? Still to come on Inside Story, two baby-faced teenagers in nice. with an evil plan. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. Their very own slasher movie. <laughs> A real-life scream with a real-life victim. Dude, oh, I just God. killed Cassie. Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik seemed like average all-American kids. Sure, they loved horror movies, but what 16-year-old boy doesn't? For them, though, it became an obsession. An obsession that ended with an innocent young girl slashed to death. 
just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. Two baby-faced killers high on adrenaline. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. They've just murdered oh. a schoolmate. They filmed it all. Dude, I just oh killed God. Cassie. As they speed away, 16-year-old Cassie Stoddart lies dead in a pool of blood. And I said, where's my baby? I was just frantic. She's been stabbed 27 times. No, this isn't happening. I just did to know this isn't happening. Cassie Stoddart never stood a chance. The killing meticulously planned by classmates Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik. Two 16-year-olds who thought they were making a real-life version of this slasher movie, Scream. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? What makes this murder so confronting is not only the age of the two killers, but also the cold, premeditated way that Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik carried it all out. We know this because they filmed pretty much the entire senseless crime. We found our victim and sad as it may be, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie. Say hi, please. Hi. Okay, see ya. To good night and I love you. And I said, good night, I love you. I'll call you in the morning. That was the last time I talked to her. Cassie Stoddart grew up in the small town of Pocatello, Idaho. She was a grade A student, hoping to become a lawyer. She loved her friends. That was her world. It was her friends and her family. She was always nice to everyone. She had a big heart. And she, she just was friends with everybody. Unlike Cassie, Tori Adamchik wasn't a gifted student. But he worked hard at it, according to his parents, Sean and Shannon. We wanted him to be an architect because he was really an amazing builder. So we always tried to encourage him to do that, but he wanted to do film. Film had always been Tori's passion. When he was 11 years old, he got his first video camera. Every spare minute, Tori would be making home movies with his younger brother. The scarier, the better. Brian Draper was a very different person to Tori Adamchik. He was adopted, a withdrawn, moody kid. By 16, he was secretly writing a movie script inspired by the Columbine High School Massacre. Young men to murder. I'll rip off your goddamn head! Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik met here at Pocatello High School and they hit it off straight away. They had a shared interest in movies, in particular, horror movies, and before long, they were planning on filming their own with Cassie Stoddart as their leading lady. But this was to be a real life horror movie. I'm getting you on tape, okay? Say hi, please. Hi. While Cassie was popular at school, Ryan and Tori were considered a bit strange, outsiders. But kind-hearted Cassie embraced them both as friends. He's supposed to be in here at 7.30 and it's 8.19. He's an hour late. Did Cassie ever suggest to you that she thought there was something a bit odd with the two boys? Oh, she says that's just the way they are. She was friends with a lot of people and she says oh, they're just that way. You, you don't even care, do you? <laughs> okay. See ya. The plot to murder Cassie was meticulous. Here in the school library, Brian and Tori put the finishing touches on their plan. Tori, September 22nd, 2006. We're skipping the last fourth hour. We're not even plan right now for tonight. It's gonna be cool. Cassie Stoddart would be dead before the day was out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Cassie's family, but she had number one. We have to stick with the plan. And she's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> the two teens had found out that Cassie would be alone that night, house sitting at her auntie's, and she'd invited them to join her. Cassie slipped and said, Hey, I'm gonna be house sitting by myself. That's where they're like, It's finally gonna happen, man. They, they couldn't have been more excited. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house 
out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? Like, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. Cassie arrived at her auntie's early evening. Do you remember what the last thing she said to you was? She said, good night and I love you. And I said, good night, I love you. I'll call you in the morning. That was the last time I talked to her. Hello? Cassie here. Hey. hey. When Brian and Tori arrived, Cassie's yeah, boyfriend, okay. Matt, was there too. Oh, yeah, how are you? Hey. Good, good. Come this way, guys. <laughs> Sorry, babe. Uh, Cassie and Matt took them on a guided tour of the house. Come with you. No one you. was looking. Brian unlocked the back door. Four teenagers then watched a movie, Kill Bill 2. <laughs> then, sometime around 10 o'clock, Brian and Tori left to go home. Or so Cassie and Matt thought. We're ready. We're listening to the greatest rock band We've ever. We've been for this for a long time. Pink Floyd. Before we commit the ultimate crime of murder. Now in a new set of clothes and carrying knives and masks, Brian and Tori slipped back into the house and cut the power. Whoa. What the f Cassie and Matt expect the power to come back on at any time, but it doesn't. Matt rang his mother to see if he could stay the night to keep Cassie company, but she refused and a short time later turned up to drive Matt home. That left Cassie in the dark and all alone. Attack was ferocious. That's the hole. Cassie Stoddart was knifed 27 times. Nine of those stab wounds were fatal. Just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fing joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I just oh killed God. Cassie. Oh. Oh, that felt like putting it real. Uh, I mean, it went by so fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. It's okay. Okay. We'll, we'll let's find movie tickets now. Okay. Come on. Goodbye. Okay. No. Goodbye. Next, police uncover the damning tape. You're evil. <laughs> yes, I am. That forces a killer to confess. Murder is power. Murder is freedom. Stoddart was dead. The popular 16-year-old schoolgirl savagely stabbed to death by her classmates, Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. As they sped away from the murder scene, the enormity of just what they've done begins to dawn on the boys. Oh, oh That's the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Brian and Tori came here to Black Rock Canyon to burn and then bury the incriminating evidence, their masks, their knives, their clothing, and most importantly, the videotape of them carrying out the crime. But it was a botched job. They didn't destroy the tape. And in the end, that would become the damning evidence that proved beyond any doubt that these two teenagers murdered their classmate, Cassie Stoddart. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Cassie's mum soon got the shocking news. I was like, no, this isn't happening, this isn't happening. When am I gonna wake up? This is a nightmare. You know, you don't think of that. You live in a safe community where, you know, everybody knows everybody, everybody trusts people. You don't think that this would ever happen to you. Pocatello detectives begin their investigation. Tori Adamchik and Brian Draper are among the first people interviewed. I want to make sure that you understand that the truth is really important. Yeah. Both deny any involvement in the murder. The police are already suspicious. And when the teenagers claim they went to the movies after leaving Cassie, their suspicions are peaked even more. Okay, so what's, what's the movie about? 
After a period of time, we, uh, we confronted him with, with the fact that we believed that he was lying about going to the movie. We, we got some problems, okay? Yeah, yeah, I understand. We, we got some problems. Movie. And, and, it's, and it's, it's really important that um, this is the time in the interview where you really need to cowboy up. Mm -hmm. You didn't go to the movie. I can tell you what we're doing. I was trying to hide this, but I guess I have to tell you. Now. You're gonna have to, man. It's the only way out. Brian Draper then changed his story. He said they didn't go to the movies. Instead, they went out robbing cars. But police quickly learned that was a lie too. For you to jerk us our chain, okay? Cassie's this great friend of yours, okay? And she's watching right now. She's hearing she, everything that you're saying. She about. has been brutally murdered. And then you have wasted our time we, at that point in time, tell Brian Draper that we believe you're again lying to us. Is it possible, aside from coincidence and all that kind of stuff, that when you got out, you parked there, did you go back to play a prank on those guys? Prank on him? On Cassie and Matt? No. Did you go there just to screw with him a little bit and pro prank? No. Is there anything to do with the murder of Cassie? No. No, I did not have anything to do with murder with Cassie. Katori. No. But while police believed Brian and Tori did have something to do with Cassie's murder, Tori's parents, Sean and Shannon, felt it just couldn't be true. I honestly believe somebody else had come back into the house afterwards, and that's what I truthfully believe. I know Tori and he just simply couldn't do that. Police now took the dramatic step of bringing Brian Draper in for a polygraph test. He was crying, he was emotional, his parents were with him. So I walked closer and he was really astounding. I mean, I was, I was, I was going on. Brian eventually admitted he was there when Cassie was murdered, but he claimed it was Tori who killed her. He would put the blame off on, on Tori mostly, that the, Corey actually stabbed Cassie and that he was just there and he didn't know that it was going to happen. So, so you're saying that, that, that Tori, Tori stabbed her, all the stab marks, Tori did it. Yes. Brian then told detectives where the pair had dumped the incriminating evidence, thinking they'd destroyed it on the night. But the most crucial piece of evidence, their own movie of the entire murder, was remarkably still intact. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Cassie's family, but she had to number one. Police now had an open and shut case. She's perfect. You've watched it? I've watched it. How did it feel watching that? I was, you know, I was, I was angry. I was very angry. I mean, he was apologizing to me already before it even happened. I'm sorry, but she had to go. She was too perfect or too beautiful. Sorry. They knew what they were doing. Police now charged Brian and Tori with Cassie's murder. Unfortunately, you're not going anywhere tonight. You're going to be placed into custody tonight, OK? Um, I'm gonna, sorry, that's the way it goes. You're going to be that's... charged with first degree murder. We knew that they had to be taken off the street. We knew they're way too dangerous to be in our community. And uh, they had to be taken off the street that day. Tori, stand up, put your hands on the wall. They came back in and they arrested him just to see his pain. I mean, he was very upset. So that's, that was troublesome to see him that upset. It was just the end of the world. I mean, just, it was just, yeah, it was just everything was over, felt like. Tori Adamchik and Brian Draper were tried as adults, even though they were just 16. Both blamed the other for the killing, but the evidence was there for all to see, and they'd filmed it all. I stabbed her in the throat, and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I just oh killed God. Cassie. Adamchik and Draper were found guilty of first-degree murder and given life without parole. You know, I, I felt like the, the life without parole was, was just. 
I felt like, uh, you know, they're both predators and they need to be, they're just not capable of functioning in our society. And, and we, we just need to warehouse them. They deserve to be where they're at for the rest of their lives. And I hope that, you know, not to be, that I don't have no forgiveness or anything. God will judge them in the end. But how can, you know, God, murder is not for, um, forgivable by God, so why should I forgive them? Coming up. My mom still treats me like a mom, and she tells me to brush my teeth as she's leaving the vicinity. The unrepentant killer and his broken-hearted mom. I'm sorry for everybody involved. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, She's our friend. The evidence was damning. You know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie. Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik filmed it themselves. We're going to go down in history. We're going to be just like Scream, except real life terms. And now they're in jail for so coldly plotting the murder of their schoolmate, Cassie Stoddart. Say hi, please. Hi. Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik will both die in prison. Brian is serving his life sentence about three hours from Pocatello, while Tori is imprisoned here in Northern Idaho. And while Brian now accepts full responsibility for the gruesome murder, Tori and his family still maintain he's innocent of murder itself, claiming he was completely misled by his mate. Twice a week, the Adam Chicks visit their son, Tori, in prison. And most other days, he calls them. Some people on the weekends, they go <laughs> do something on the weekend. And this is what we want to do, spend our time with Tori. My mom still treats me like a mom. And she tells me to brush my teeth as she's leaving the visiting. And Back in Bargo, New South Wales, Sandra and David Octoloni are also grappling with their grandson's yeah. murder. I think the hardest part is, like, we raised him and all of a sudden he was just, after celebrating his birthday, within four hours he was gone. We'll never see him again. How often do you stop and think, gee, I wonder what David would be doing if he was here today? Oh, all the time. I'd be doing something and It'll come back to me that I did this with David. I just have a flashback to if David was there, you know. It's now four years since David was murdered by Matthew Malat, the troubled teenager determined to follow in the footsteps of his uncle, serial killer Ivan Malat. Matthew, you're going to be charged with the murder of David off the lady? Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Malat's accomplice, Cohen Klein, was not only a willing partner in the shocking crime, he filmed the whole brutal attack. Is there anything else you want to tell us about David's murder? Not that I can think of at the moment. They lured him. And, and David was such a trusting soul. You know, he never thought bad of anyone. He was just lured to his death. But to me, they just wanted to make a big name for themselves. And Malat jumped on the, the bandwagon of Ivan and he wanted to be bigger and better. 
Do you think with Matthew Malat it was in the blood? He said, I'm a Malat, you know what we do. So that says it all, doesn't it? How beautiful, grandson. Hmm. It'll kill you. It'll, you'll eat yourself away inside if you dwell on it all the time. They're just not part of my life anymore, but David is and always will be. I think we'll go.